we can now ask, open the floor for the question and answer session. I think we've covered the most important aspects of what's been a very difficult year, I have to say. We have been quite successful in overcoming those problems with some very solid results. Our model has been consolidated, as I say, in a very negative uh, scenario. We've been able to reduce our debt in absolute terms and also from the point of view of uh, multiples. Our internationalization of the group has been extremely successful and we now have access to lenders and uh, refinancing um, assets. We've been able to tap those markets very successfully. And we have consolidated as well our commercial links with many financial institutions that uh, have seen in us a very important source of assets. So I think in the future that will certainly benefit us. Uh, it is already, but it will continue to be the case in the future. And as I said, the model having gone through this very difficult year I believe is a model that has uh, unlimited scalability vis-a-vis -vis the future. So that uh, is that and if you would like we can open the floor now for a Q&A. Uh, Sorry Jose, were you listening in English? Could you actually understand? Can you understand more or less? Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Raimundo Fernández Cuesta from Nomura. First of all, I'd like to thank the chairman for the presentation this year. You said that 2010 has been a difficult year. And I wanted to ask about the outlook for 2011. At least as I see it, 2010 for energy, given the prices and Transmediterranean, and perhaps some bad luck or more competition perhaps has not been such a good year. But in 2011, do you think that things will stabilize? Will there be a general recovery in the businesses? Do you think that the cycle will change and that will have an impact on the different divisions? The next question I have has to do with the sale of assets, the destocking, and also the concessions. But coming back to Transmediterranean in the past, You've talked about selling off that division, and although this year hasn't been so good, the restructuring has been successful compared to the results you reported in 2008. So are you still thinking of selling off this business in 2011, or do you expect to hold on for it for a bit longer? Well, Raimundo. The sales of assets the sales of assets, or the possible sale of assets, taking them off our perimeter, if they're not core to our business, that is always possible. But given that right now we don't have any pressing need to divest assets, and given that we still have work to do to optimize the way Transmediterranean works, I would say right now that you shouldn't expect an imminent divestment. Although it's true that were a good opportunity to come up, then we would take it up with interest, or perhaps with more interest even than for other assets. But it really, it's like always, it depends. And as for the outlook for 2011, well, as you know, we don't give guidance, or if we do, it's only very generic. But very briefly, going over our different businesses in infrastructure, I think that the outlook's positive as we're beginning to consolidate our international operation. And we're beginning to get better, not good, but I mean, obviously we're just starting to build up our portfolios and so the margins aren't as good, but they're better. I don't know all the reasons I said before, but 
They are better. They're beginning to get better. In domestic construction, if the PP get delayed, then we could have a significant improvement. The concessions there, I hope that we'll be able to rotate concessions satisfactorily this year, and I'm pretty sure that we will. And then in energy, as you can imagine, the current situation has an impact on prices. And although the Spanish prices are still low, lower in generation than the rest of Europe, well, all of Europe, yes. No, I mustn't say all because I haven't actually looked at the figures, but definitely the neighboring countries, we're much lower than them. But nonetheless, all energy prices are going up. 51, well, at the moment the pool's at 47. Last week, there were many days when it was at 49. So we can imagine that that's the way it's going to have to go. The prices will go up. The consolidation of the renewables model is really important for me. It's a qualitative matter, of course, more than quantitative, but it's really important for me because I believe that there will be a tendency for the debate about whether or not we should have renewable energy will obviously just disappear. It's obvious now. There's a study which came out from Deloitte recently about where the price was, would be if we didn't have renewables. Think of what the electricity prices would be here. In, we've gone from a dependency in Spain of 47% of our total energy. Well, anyway, roughly 50% in electricity. And uh, that was mainly because of bringing in renewables, above all wind energy. So renewables are really important. So anyone who casts any doubt on it is going to be laughed down. And I think that's really important for us for the next few years. Obviously, renewables are here to stay. And as for Trasmed, well, obviously, oil prices do have an impact on that business or transport is impacted and just because it's maritime transport doesn't make it any different. Water, well, that's a business which is progressing very adequately and we continue to build up a backlog and move into new countries and right now I think we've come to a moment when we can consider that water has started to be an essential factor. In fact, a couple of weeks back I was in the Middle East. It's surprising. No one's talking about energy, despite all the circumstances there. They're all talking about water. That's their main concern throughout the Middle East and in Africa, definitely. Water is what worries them. And at the moment, maybe it's being obscured by the circumstances that we're seeing with the energy imbalances and all the problems in the north of Africa. But for the future, that's what the world is concerned about. It's one of the biggest challenges for the future. And I don't think there'll be a big leap forward this year or anything, but the outlook for growth in a beta this year would be double digit growth. And I would expect this year, well, naturally, all other factors remaining constant without any unexpected surprises. I would say it's going to be a positive year, a year of positive growth. And there was something I wanted, a little caveat, but I can't even remember what it was, so I'll, let's leave it at that. Why don't you pass your microphone around yourselves? Okay, hello, Pablo Cuadrado from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. I've got three questions. One would be to start with the regulations on renewables after what happened last year and the new framework and all the comments that the chairman made about the importance of the framework to 2012. Could you give us your view of what could happen with the election timetable that we have here in Spain, 
do you expect to see any more visibility coming in regarding regulation for what would happen after 2012? Uh, should we expect regulation to be enacted before the elections or will it be delayed? And then the dividend. This morning, I think I read some articles in the press saying that there was a proposal to take out the dividend. I, w I must say I was surprised. I haven't said, seen anything of that in your press releases, but is there any proposal to either cut back or what well, our dividend? Yes, I, I think that was what I read in the press. I, I think it's probably wrong. Could you confirm? And then your capex this year, you've got less capex, more renewables under construction. But look at your strategy plan that you presented last year. It seems that there have been a lot of changes. And this level of a ca gross capex of about a billion a year, would that be what you'd expect to see in 2011? Well, regarding regulation, I do hope, but I don't have anything more than the public information that everyone has about it, that the new regulations for new assets will be enacted in the next few months. We should remember that there's an agreement with the Subcommission for Energy. There's an energy policy statement that you've probably seen. It came out in, well, two or three months ago. And that should serve as the basis establishing the main guidelines, which gives us a general idea about things. Obviously, the details could change. There'll be more ramifications, but I do hope that we'll be seeing at least the basic guidelines come out this year. I don't know if you've got anything more to say about that. And then as to the dividend, I don't know what you've read, but whatever you've read, we haven't said it anywhere, and we haven't even thought it. No. We've approved it and we've published it. It's 197 cents no, 197 million, sorry, is what we're going to pay out. And that's very much in line. With our strategy plan, which going up to 2014 and annualizing the figures, it said there would be an annual aggregate of 3% and, and we're definitely in compliance with that. And then your third question about CAPEX. Well there. The environment in 2011 will be one of higher CAPEX than in 2010 and maybe slightly above the 1 billion which was a uniform figure for all the years of the plan, because a lot of things that were initiated in 2010 will be finished in 2011. I don't know if you want to add to that. Yes, we have an investment program, above all, for concentrated solar thermal power, with an investment plan for 2011. And then for wind power, we've got Mexico, There'll be some 306 megawatts in Mexico, which should come online in 2011, plus a wind farm in the United States. And so it's going to be a year of high investment because of having so many development pro projects coming to an end. And what's positive here is that they're all investments that we have made except the United States one, which perhaps might be suboptimal. But we needed to roll it out because we had old commitments already made. We'd already bought the machinery and we looked at the market and you know what's happening in the US at the moment. <coughs> Things aren't too positive there right now, but we had to do what we had to do. It was impossible to get a PPA. There, but all the other investments are investments that we have made on the basis 
of criteria of strict investment discipline. And nonetheless, we have managed to get the rates of return, the new rates of return that we have as our target, so that they are financiable under the current economic circumstances. And I must say, I'm very positive that the investments which we're managing to fund without any big problems at all, well, not even with any problems really, it's quite easy to fund them. The lenders are really interested in financing them because they're very good investments. All of them, well, apart from one, which is a very specific case, which isn't that good. It's not that it's that bad either, but it's based on an old decision, an old commitment we made, which we had to comply with, but all the rest look very positive. Hola, buenos días. Good morning. Javier Ruiz Capillas from Kepler. I had three questions. The first one has to do with construction. The EBITDA margins for the fourth quarter were very good. And I'd like to know if there's any special event that might have justified that. Is there an explanation for it? Do you think that next year the EBITDA margin will be the same as it was in 2010 at around about 5%? And then your working capital, you said that there was a positive, it had a positive impact on the cash flow for the company. Can you give us the figures for that in million euros? And can you give us the figure for 2009 too, to compare it against? And if you can give us this positive figure, can you explain how much of it came from real estate? And then the, the Thermosolar transaction, your sale of that 15%. Can you give us more information on that? How's it structured? And do you have any valuation ratios, million euros per megawatt, enterprise value, compared to the 6.23 that you put out in your March presentation? Yes, let's start with your last question about the Mitsubishi transaction, as you know. We've got a company in which we've got four thermosolar plants and we've sold to Mitsubishi a 15% of our stake there with a right to increase that up to a further 2%. So that gives us credit of 300 million from four financial institutions in Japan under good conditions. And for us, I can say that although it's obviously confidential, we can't give you all the details, but the investment ratio would be about 5 million euros per megawatt. And those four plants are valuated at about 6.8 million euros per million euros per megawatt. As to the working capital, in 2010, indeed, there was a substantial increase in the working capital, which improved, well, it was about 300 and 50 million euros. Basically, that was because of what Juan Muro said about actually collecting the tax rebate we got in the previous year, and then the improvement in collection in infrastructures above all. And then the construction margins there. 2011, we expect, on the basis of what the chairman said, talking about the general economy, we should see margins, beta margins, to be under pressure because of the international area and the development costs that we have there. But the pre-tax profit, there we apply positive cash flow to international things. That's 3.7% for 2010. And we expect that to remain flat for 2011 as well. That's... Can you use your microphone? Otherwise, we can't hear. I forgot to ask. Should we expect any transaction like what you had in solar thermal? Given that there are some assets that are quite mature, are you going to do any asset rotation there? Is wind power an industry where you're not expecting to rotate any assets apart from in non-strategic markets? But mainly, yes, it will only be in non-strategic markets. But we're not discarding any possibilities. I mean, there's no sacred 
at it if a uh, good opportunity came up. Right now, what's really important for us, and everything is subject to this, is that we must maintain the improvement that we are seeing on our net debt ratio, our NFD ratio. So that will be our main objective. Obviously, we've got other targets and they are still there. But if in order to reach that target at some time, we have to sell off a strategic wind farm or whatever because price or demand changed or there was a purchaser who was really interested in buying that asset, nothing's sacred. I don't know if I've answered your question, but right now, immediately, no, there's nothing that we're thinking of setting off. Can you hear? Daniel Ortega from BBVA. I've got two questions, basically. The first has to do with the new concessions that you've maintained available for sale. Can you give us the EBITDA associated to them? And is it included in the 2010 figures, or is it already consolidated? And then, Acciona Winpa, I saw that in the end you got a positive EBITDA for 2010. Can you give us some color on this for next year, both as manufacturers and as operators? What do you expect to see in wind turbines? Are prices going to go on going down? Or do you think that business volumes and prices are going to improve in that business? Well, I can answer your second question, and then Juan can give you more color on the others. OK, the turbines then, the generators. The outlook for the market is for it to flatten out, stabilize. Yes, I'm being very prudent. Actually, there'd probably be a, an improvement. It's not so much prices yet, but there is an improvement that we're seeing in the strategic interest being shown by many industrial investors in the world. They want to get into this sector. So that's the first general statement I can make, and then I'll give you a second general statement, and then we'll move on. Axiona has a product that we consider to be very good, and everybody else recognizes that. If you look at the quality of our wind turbines, the robust design of the machinery, the productivity we're seeing in output. However, we do have a problem of brand visibility. It's a brand that was always part of Axiona, and it was mainly for internal consumption. Therefore, we do have certain difficulty in the market of buyers for these turbines because we're competing with Vesta, Siemens, General Electric. <laughs> they're big players and they're well known, and so obviously there is a problem in visibility there. And then, the capacity, well, our prices are competitive. We have practically the best prices in the market according to the recent services we have. Our wind turbines have fantastic prices. But how much better does your price have to be in order for a customer to be willing to buy an Axiona generator rather than a Siemens or a General Electric one. It has to be very much better. It's the same. Well, I mean, the reasons are obvious. So given that, we are analyzing the possibility of partnerships or taking out stakes. And we are in conversations. We haven't made a lot of progress yet. At the moment, it's really chatting over coffee. But we're talking to possible industrial investors who might want to get involved in the wind turbine business. Right now in the world, as you know, there are big competitors, but at the most, a dozen, really. 
and half a dozen of them are focusing on their own region and so they don't really compete on the international market, at least not efficiently. So the sector of wind turbines for any industrial investor is really an essential part of their product menu, you could say, and we're beginning to notice that right now. We have various conversations, contacts being made. People are beginning to ask, would we like to get involved in a transaction for a corporate transaction for turbines? And then we've seen far more of these suggestions and contacts in the last few months. But we're not sellers. We don't want to sell sell off our business, our wind turbine business. That, that would be easy because there's definitely demand for that business. But we're not in the selling market. But what we would consider is a strategic agreement that would enable us to compete with the right brand, with a footprint in markets where we could work and compete with the big players. And I think that's possible. There is interest. And we're definitely interested in developing the business along those kinds of lines. Oh, and then there was another question you had about the EBITDA on the concessions. I'm sorry he's not using the microphone. In the EBITDA for the company for 2010? Yes, they're included. 42 million euros is the EBITDA from concessions. And Jorge, you had something to say. We need a microphone to translate. The question was whether the contribution in 2010 from the concessions available for sales included in the results that are given. The answer was yes. And how much is it? Well, 42 million euros. I would like you to clarify something. In the fourth quarter then, for construction, there's no one-offs. There's no one-off impact. No. And then taking advantage of having the CFO here, I've got a couple of questions about debt. Approximately, how much of the debt is exposed to variable rates for 2010? And how do you think the average cost of debt will pan out during 2011? For 2010, we've covered about 54% of our debt. The provision we have for 2011 is to have a margin covered more of about that 1.5 billion. We should get up to nearly 100%. So for 2011, we will have hedged about 70% of our debt. And what was the other question? Oh, the average cost, about 5.5. And Juan, I think it would be worth going into more detail about our exposure. I think that's what the question was about, our exposure to interest rates going up. OK. If we're at about 70% of the debt hedge for 2010, or covered. We've got a sensitivity analysis, which says that more or less, w with a variation of 10 basis points, the impact on the bottom line would be about 2.5 million, at the most. And if we have higher coverage, then the impact would go down. 80% then it would go down to about 1.5 million euros. It depends on the level of hedging then. We mainly do it under project finance, so a lot of the amount is has to be hedged. It's part that uh, that's what the lenders insist that you do before you even start. So at the moment, one percentage point would have an impact 
of between 15 and 20, wouldn't it, for 2011, with hedging at 80%. Fernando Garcia from Espiritu Santo Investment. I've just got one question left about net debt. I think that on the 15th of November, you indicated that the net figures would be between 8.2 and 8.4 billion euros. And what difference is there between that and the final figure which you reported, which was 7.5 billion for the net debt? Basically, the difference is for three items, one you saw in the slide, looking at the assets that are available for sale and the change in the way we book a concession so that we use the same accounting criteria as our partner. So that would be 979 million euros. And from September to December, there was an improvement in working capital of about 500 million euros, 250, sorry, 220 because of getting the corporation tax back and then the rest is an improvement in the working capital in that period basically because of infrastructures and the destocking we did in our real estate portfolio as we sold off homes and I'd imagine that you'll be asking what the reason is that we've made these assets available for sale whereas we hadn't even announced them as available for sale when we gave our third quarter presentation. Including these assets as available for sale was something we did because we think that it's highly probable that we'll be able to sell them in the year. Otherwise, we wouldn't have done it. And to September 2010, we couldn't have that degree of certainty. Obviously, it's not total certainty, but we didn't even have that degree of certainty that we do have. So what we debated in October and November and December was that given that there were a lot of people who seemed to be interested and possible buyers were coming to us, it seemed to us that the probability of selling all these assets is very high, and therefore we decided it was worth taking on board that risk, in inverted commas, of making them available for sale. If at the end of the period it, they couldn't be sold, then we'd have to book them back onto the P&L, which <laughs> would look a bit ridiculous, and obviously make them available for sale and then say they're not, wouldn't look good. So we wanted to have a degree of certainty before we did so. And given the signs of interest we got and the conversations that we were starting up, it seemed to us highly probable that those assets would be sold during the period. Moreover, these assets, the bit that's taken off our balance sheet and p and is the debt. But all the assets have an equity value that isn't included in those numbers. It's the equity value which will contribute to reducing debt when we actually sell them. So that gives us a considerable margin when we sell them off to reduce our debt. Have I explained myself clearly? Any more questions? Any questions over the webcast? Excuse me. Jose Porta? I simply wanted to come back to the non-generation part of your energy division. You gave us a breakdown of expenses. Promotion, 48 million. And what capacity do you have to act on that item? Our capacity there? It's considerable, yes. We have a lot of control over it. And we're going to apply that capacity to act on that figure. Cutting back these costs to reflect the reality of the market. The reality of the market is that the availability of new projects right now is greater than what it was and the access to such transactions is easier. It doesn't require the same outlay to be able to develop these things here in Spain. Right now there are 
as many projects as one wants to take up. There are a whole lot of projects that could be developed. So the capacity to develop projects doesn't have to be internal now. And obviously that means that we can take measures here. Good morning, uh, Med Miguel Medina, JB Capital. Two quick questions. My first has to do with the appraisal of real estate. Could you give us the appraisal of the land at the end of uh, 2009 to see how that's evolved compared with 2010 figures? And about Chile, the possible asset rotation there. The two highways uh, you mentioned, the only option is to uh, participate in the um, OBB on the highway, or, or do you have other options available to you, um, that joint venture? Not only we do have the possibility of being involved in the joint venture, but there are also other buyers interested, so we're not forced to participate in, in that with Atlantia, and uh, we don't expect to do so in actual fact. There is some interest coming from a number of investors, but I think our answer is clear. We are under no obligation to participate in that joint venture. Nonetheless, the possibility exists, the option is there. With regards to the appraisal of uh, the land uh, price in 2009, 891 million was the um, amount and 858 million are the figures for 2010. Any questions from the webcast? Trindado from BPI. Please go ahead with your question. Yes, hi, good morning. Two questions, if I may. The first one is if you could provide us uh, the detail of 979 million uh, you mentioned of uh, changes in debt. If you could give us what is the detail for the changes in consolidation adjustments, and then whether you have any uh, off balance sheet debt as factoring that we should be considering here apart from the, the net debt reported. And finally, just uh, in terms of new installations for 2011, if we could consider the numbers you give us on the construction megawatts. Thank you. Repeating. <laughs> Excuse me, do you mind repeating your questions and speaking a bit slowly, please? Intento en español. La primera, si nos pueden dar el desglose de los 979 millones, ¿cuál es la parte que viene por cambios de consolidación? Y, y si nos puede decir si hay, aparte de, de la deuda reportada, alguna deuda off balance sheet como factoring en, uh, en vuestras cuentas a finales del año. Y por energía, ¿se nos pueden dar una idea de nuevas instalaciones en 2011 o si podremos considerar como proxy lo que está en construcción uh, que vais en la diapositiva? Gracias. What was on the slide? Respecto al desglose de... Regards the breakdown of the 979 million euros that we saw on the slide, due to accounting criteria changes, 372 were explained by that. And regarding uh, assets available for sale, that's 606 million euros. So those are the two amounts. And there's no factoring um, involved there. Under construction, 604 megawatt in wind energy, and we could probably end up the year at around 711, perhaps we can get the exact figure.
2011 then, as we said earlier, we've begun 779 megawatts in construction and we expect to end the year at around uh, 707, so 318 megawatts is probably what we expect to be producing through the mix of different technologies. The reception is not very good, so it's, um, kindly speak slowly if you're going to ask the question whether it's in Spanish or in English, it's difficult to hear from here. Very nice speed, thank you. Um, yes, we repeat the, the numbers we provided before. Uh, as of December 2010, we finished the year with 739 megawatts under construction, which is 639 Win and 100 CSP Spain. And the current estimate is to uh, finalized 2011 with 850 new megawatts, 780 win, and 50 of CSP. On the <clears throat> on your second question about whether our target for the um, for the for the strategic plan uh, 2013, the answer is yes we can continue to say that we would be on target. Um, there may be a few months, and when I say few, I mean few, uh, of uh, delay to reaching the 2.4 objective, but yes, the answer in general is yes, we're on track. Let's see if I understand your question. You're saying that the, there is an accounting method change which accounts for, which takes off about 370 million. Um, the, that 370 million has nothing to do with the assets for sale. I am sure, I, I, I suppose you, you, you were clear on that. And there's 600 on assets that are being put for sale which do not account in any way on the uh, and do not account in any way uh, of the equity of those assets maybe you want to clarify your question does not include the equity value and the capital gain on those assets In terms, of, in terms of debt, <coughs> is is 600. Uh, in terms of equity, it will be whatever, um, depending on the final price of the of the assets. But uh, the 970 whatever uh, includes the change of accounting 
uh, asset. Change of accounting rules for, for one asset. Does that, does that answer your question? There are no more questions. <laughs> Are there any more questions here in the room? <laughs> what were the earlier ones, Stefan? <laughs> I didn't really understand that 49 million in FX, in Forex, on your PL. I didn't really understand where they came from. Is there any thing else on the EBITDA that reflects them? I mean, in the PL, I think it's about 149 million in exchange rate movements. Yes, these are the outcome of the transactions done in Mexico, above all. Easy to explain. The exchange rate difference with the peso, the Mexican peso which was materialized during the year and was booked then to the P&L. So there's nothing that's got anything to do with EBITDA. It's a purely financial matter. So it comes below EBITDA. Yes, if there has to be a counterparty in Mexican pesos and the other counterparty in euros, then when it's materialized during the year, then you book it to that year. The construction, yes. Not the financing. But the construction, yes, exactly. In that case, yes, you do. <laughs> Just a very specific thing. It seemed to me that I have read that you've bought a minority stake in the solar business in the USA. Um, could you give us a figure if that's the case and you can confirm it? Is it confirmed? It's a small transaction, anyway. It's really not particularly important. Well, in operating terms, it is important because it gives us greater freedom to operate in CSP. But as to the money, it's not that much. And anyway, it's not been disclosed yet, so I can't give you the exact figure. I can just say that it's, I mean, in global terms, for the company, it's a marginal expense. But it's the end of a long-lasting dispute and there was a clause, luckily a shotgun clause, either you buy me out or I buy you out and in the end we decided that we would buy and that solves the problems and means that we can go on working in the international CSP market because otherwise things were being blocked because of that dispute. If you haven't got any other questions then many thanks. And um, see you again soon. And of course, anything you want to ask us, you just have to call us up and we can have one-on-one -on -one sessions or whatever.